مرحبا شكرا كيف احوالك؟ الحمد لله اخر الاخبار شو الاخبار؟ والله تمام كيف اخبارك؟ الحمد لله والشكر يعني كويس نشوفك في اليوم اوه سوري دونت سبيك عربيك اوه وير جاست تشينجينج وير تشينجينج ذا رولز اوه امريكانز ار نوت لينجويستيك ات سيمز اكزاكتلي ذاتس هاو ات فيل تو بي ذا اذر Well, that was a brilliant uh, film, Mo, actually, because it told us all about the foundation. foundation. I want to have a conversation about more your own upbringing and the values, more importantly, the values in which you were brought up with. You grew up in Sudan and then in Egypt, and then we'll talk about the rest. But what are these, the foundational values that are still impacting your life today? Right. Uh, I, I, I am a Nubian, and... Uh, <coughs> Uh, Nubians is a small community which straddles Sudan and Egypt around the Nile. It's a very old civilization. It has its own language, etc. Uh, only maybe 300,000 people, etc. Half of them live in Sudan, half in Egypt. Although the half in Egypt is vastly disappearing, that's another issue. Uh, it is a tight community. Uh, we have a very, very long history. We, 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 we are the original pharaohs anyway. Uh, but uh, it's also a poor community. We, we, we don't have much wealth. We don't have oil or gas or diamonds or anything. We base agriculture and the Nile. The Nile is a lifeline for us. And, uh, but it, is, it, it has these wonderful values of, of you know, of a community, we are a community. You don't go to sleep with, if your neighbor did not have dinner. If a father dies somewhere, the children are responsibility of everybody. And this is something is we do. We do without even thinking. It is a matter of honor. And uh, people are valued. Uh, by what you call their honor, not by their money or the size of bank accounts. That's how community respects. Uh, the community also respects women. I recall my, both my grandmothers, uh, both sides, were leaders in their community. Men will come and sit at their feet to discuss issues, uh, problems they have their own, their wives, and, and I was amazed about how grown-up men d differ uh, to women. Uh, when in the communities around us, it is shameful sometimes even to mention a woman's name. Uh, in our community, it is normal to relate you to your mother's name. You know, uh, when I was a kid, I go to the village, and people don't know me because I don't live in the village, and they ask, who is this boy? And they say, it is Mo Ibrahim. They say, who is Mo Ibrahim? They say, oh, he's the son of Aida. My mother's name is Aida. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it is, it is a different kind of, of, of environment there. So it is just normal. We have a saying in our own, because we have our own language, which is again disappearing, which says that the, the shroud, the shroud is our, when, when people die, they wrap them in a shroud. Uh, to to, to uh, bury them, they say the shroud has no pockets, mm. and this is a very uh, very important uh, something to say. The shroud has no pockets. You cannot take your wallet with you. You cannot take your American Express with you. Remember that, and th this is, a, is, is 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 something people really mean, and uh, that affects you for the rest of your life. Uh, this sense of community, uh, we are all born equal, and we need to look after each other. And, and uh, I think this was a great uh, values actually given. I hope I pass it to my children. I don't know if it succeed or not. The problem, my children live in Western environment, which is a bit more materialistic, but I find very hard to try to install the, I don't know if it succeed or not, we'll see. Well, your philanthropy shows that you're passing it to the world. And knowing Hadil, I think you're also passing it to your children. I hope so. Um, well, let's talk. Then you moved, you know, then you got your doctorates, and then you moved to business, in telecommunication business. And 
you sort of, I would say, you made an impact first on Africa through your business first. It's true. What are, what are the lessons that you learned from the business journey, you know, in, in terms of values that you eventually took it to philo philanthropy? That's what an, are the lessons? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, when I did my first business uh, out of frustration, I don't, I don't know, I have much time to go through my personal stories or whatever. In pure, you know, very briefly, I was, I was an academic and I was working in developing propagation, radio propagation models for the mobile industry. That's well, well before cellular uh, and this stuff. And uh, then uh, I was asked by British Telecom to come to be, to join them as a technical director to design the first mobile networks in Europe, actually, which we did in UK. And it was a good opportunity as an engineer to go and play with a big, you know, that's a big trend set, you know. Engineers are children. They love to play with trend sets. And it's a wonderful profession, actually. I recommend it. And uh, so that was my chance to, to have this uh, uh, wonderful opportunity. So I did that. We had the first uh, hand portable system in the world. We installed it in, UK, in London in 85. I grew frustrated with the culture in British Telecom, which is another story. And uh, so what you do is say, okay, I'm going to leave, I'm going to, what I do, I'm going to be a consultant. And very quickly I discovered that is, uh, I cannot handle all the work, I had to have some people. Anyway, I ended up being a businessman. When did, so we started a company called MSI, which ended up being the largest uh, independent technology house in Europe. We designed half the mobile networks in Europe, in France, in Germany, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Spain, we did Moscow, we did uh, Singapore, China. We did, you know, we had 17 subsidiaries worldwide, and we specialized in the network design. You know, with 10 key design contracts, and uh, I was amazed that nobody, when every, everybody, every company was rushing to uh, uh, acquire mobile network licenses everywhere, and they paying a huge amount of money. Uh, if you recall the numbers uh, at that time, but nobody was willing to do Africa. Yes. And we said, why, why are you guys are not going to do this in Africa? And the answer was always that, oh, it is difficult. Uh, corruption, dictatorships. It, now, the story about Africa is that Africa always had a bad press, always had a bad reputation. There is a huge gap between reality and perception. Because people forget that Africa is 54 countries. 54 countries. You have the good, you have the bad, you have the ugly. You have everybody. And the problem is, what dominates our news channel is the bad. Mm -hmm. Because that's what makes news. If there is a genocide in a country, if there is a famine, in, uh, you know, if there's fighting in Somalia, this is news. But people going happily to their fields and getting married, having children, is not news. So out of these 54 countries, I can make a huge list of countries which you have never heard about. You don't know it ever existed even, because it's not in the news. There's nothing happening. So that was a clear issue uh, for, uh, for me, uh, is that perception between uh, the, the gap between perception and reality. Again, as a businessman, you know, when there is a gap between perception and reality, there is a huge business opportunity. Mm -hmm. Of course. Because the market doesn't see reality. The market sees perception. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, being in Africa also, I felt a little bit insulted. And uh, so I said, okay, well, let's go and do Africa. Uh, the interesting lesson we learned when doing Africa was Everybody told us, you are crazy. You're going to lose your money. Our first company was a great success. And uh, I sold it in 2000. I think the company started with 50,000 pounds. We sold it for about 900 something million dollars. Mm -hmm. And I was very proud that 33% of the shares was in the hand of my employees. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe in... in in, in employee shareholders, I mean, I, I want to have partners, not employees. 
So uh, that was uh, something really one. And I think we have been very successful because of that. When you make your workers shareholders, it changes the whole chemistry, the whole atmosphere in the business. I don't need to worry who comes to 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock, who leaves at 5. Nobody leaves. It is their company. Mm -hmm. It is fun. So I, this is my best advice, really. If you want to have fun and make a lot of money, give shares to your workers. <laughs> then it, is, it changes the whole thing. Anyway, so we decided to go and do that. And people said corruption. And so we had a very interesting board at that time. We, 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 we got uh, the first chief executive of Vodafone was on my board. The, uh, Laura Pryor, who's a celebrated UK politician, statesman, was on my board. I had a director from IFC, the Wallet Bank, from FAO. We had a lot of a big board for a small company starting to operate in Africa. And that was my intention. And uh, in our first board meeting, we said, OK, are we going to make a statement about corruption? I said, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, we're going to make a statement to say, not a single dollar. So that was our motto, not a single dollar in corruption. Then I asked the board, how are we going to implement that? You know what? Every board of every company in the world, any of these big companies around us here, they have something similar. We don't pay, we don't pay this. And then the board turn a blind eye mm -hmm. and let all this nonsense happen down there. And they swear, I don't know. I, you know, I just want to make sure you don't go to prison. So I, I said, okay, how, how we execute? How we execute this? It's nice to make a slogan, but how we do it? And we came to the conclusion that the best way to do this is not for a board sitting somewhere in Europe or in the US to make all these wonderful statements. The point is to support your people on the ground. We said, OK, we have these mobile companies. Each mobile company is an entity in each country. And we end up having 14 of them in 14 countries. We have all the CEOs running all these businesses. How are we going to support your CEO? Your CEO running your operation in, I'm giving an example anyway. Let's say Uganda. And then the director of intelligence or director of the police or Museveni or his comes into his home in the evening and say, OK, I have an election next month. Are you guys going to support me or not? This guy is intimidated. How are we going to support him? That was, that's the challenge for business if you want to. And for nonprofit as well. They face the same challenges on the ground. Yeah. We, we made a very interesting, simple decision. We solved the problem. Very easy. We said, OK, as a board, we will not allow any body in the company, including myself. I'm the chairman and founder of the company. I'm, you know, whatever. Nobody can sign a check of more than 30,000 pounds without a board approval. Now, that appeared to be very onerous on the business side because it's a big company. It's running and it forced us to produce a tight budget, very clear budget. But also, it required the full support of the board. So I turned to the board member. I said, OK, we had 13 people on the board. If you really see that's about this, this means for our business not to be hurt. If there is any expenditure above 30,000 points, I have to pass a resolution. This means within 24 hours, I need each of one of you to be able to respond. Otherwise, we cannot run the business. And it was amazing, the wonderful response, response of our 14, uh, uh, 13 business people. Because somebody is in US, somebody in holiday, somebody. I had all their mobile numbers, their children numbers, their wives numbers, their girlfriends numbers. And anybody, anytime, if there is a need, we explain to the board what is the need is and what is who's going to do is this, and we get the approval. Within 24 hours, we have, because we have to have 100% when you pass uh, a board resolution like that. So it is the commitment and the seriousness of the board when it says, I fight corruption, we say, you have to really put your skin in the game. And that solved the problem. And once we did this, everybody in Africa knew we don't pay bribes. 
There's no need. Nobody came to us. I think I finally got it, actually, because you were able to operate a business in Africa without corruption. Yes. Thus, it sort of informed your philanthropy. It informed your award, you know, which is uh, the, one of the biggest awards in the world for non-corrupt leaders. Is that, is that the foundation, Absolutely. how you bridge between your business it, and philanthropy? It, it brings all these things comes together. Mm. And, it, you know, it, it, it brings an understanding of the process of corruption. And when you understand that we as a business people are part and parcel of the corruption process, mm -hmm. only then we'll be able to start to deal with it. There's no point to talk about this minister or this guy being corrupt. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about ourselves, if we're really serious. Okay. And we can do it as business people. And that is something we need really to, 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 to talk about. That's why I go around business schools, we're talking, I was sitting on the board of London Business School, I speak in other business schools, we say, look guys, you need to change the way we train our future business uh, people. We have to be ethical in the way we do the business because the world is going really belly up around us. I agree. Were you engaged in philanthropy as you were doing the business or sort of you finished the business journey and then said, I'm going to migrate to philanthropy? No, we said after, from the outset, when we formed the company, uh, the, the second company, Celtel, uh, from the, I told everybody that you guys know what, any money I'm gonna make out of this company, I'm gonna give it back to Africa. Because this is an African company, the money we're making is we're making in Africa. We'll pay our taxes in Africa. We were the largest taxpayer in, in, in about nine countries in Africa, which is amazing. It's not, it's not the oil, yeah. it's not the gas, it's not, it's not the diamonds or the copper, it's us. Anyway. And uh, we said, yeah, all the money will have to go, I don't need it. I, I'm comfortable, I, I made money from my first company. I, I'm comfortable with that. So that was, everybody knew that. But I could not do what I do now while I have big business in Africa, obviously. Because we're gonna have a very firm position vis-a-vis uh, -vis governments and leaders, and we're gonna point the fingers. And if I run the largest company in that country, the taxpayers, it's gonna be a problem for the company and for the business. As a businessman, it's difficult to get involved in politics because we are really a political organization. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so to do that, you have to be free. Yeah. So now I'm unemployed. I, I don't need any jobs from anybody. I don't need a medal. I don't need, then I'm free to say what I want to say uh, without conflicts. Which is what I love the most about you, because you say it as it is. You roll your eyes when you say, ah, oh, about homosexuality, as of that, we need that. You know, you, you, you're gutsy, even in the award, the Mo Ibrahim Award, it's sort of gutsy, I would say. It's loud, it's fearless. Um, is that part of your strategy? And how, well, I have so many questions related to that. First is, does size matter? The size of the award, the size of the giving, the size of how you do things, does that matter? We had a lot of discussion about this in the board and we agonized over that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to, to grab attention in one hand. Secondly, we, we actually have a problem with retiring African leaders. Mm -hmm. when, if, you are African, if you are a leader in Europe, say, or U.S. or whoever, you retire. You have a life after office, okay? You retire with a hopefully clean hands and everything, but see how much Obama was offered for his memoirs, yeah? Any bank, any fund will be very happy to have Tony Blair or to have, where are all the, look where all our previous prime ministers in Europe went. They're all in the board of all this. Maybe rightly, you know, they have experience, they have whatever. Uh, so they have life after office. They don't need to actually, they get rich after they leave office, all of them. Now, where our leaders go, if you are clean, where do you go? There's no really pension to take care of you. There is nothing. And no bank will take it because who cares about the, vast, you know, the previous president of Botswana? J.P. Morgan is gonna offer him a seat on the board? Out of question. So what happened to those guys? Now, we say, 
if you are really a wonderful person and you finish this job, we want to take you to civil society. We say, now, what's your passion? You start your foundation. So one guy said, okay, I am about girl education. So he kind of has his foundation about girl, girls education and he goes around with his foundation, talk, also talk to other African leaders about why Kill Foundation is, is important. Now, he is funded by this. So what he gets is, is just reasonable to live uh, sensibly and uh, not to worry about jobs or... Uh, 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 they become role models. You go and speak. Somebody focus on the issue of AIDS. Uh, somebody do peacemaking. peacemaking. All our laureates have been working in Madagascar. The guys who did the deal on the peace of Madagascar was one of our laureates. They negotiated in Congo to try to solve the problem. They tried to deal with the issue of Boko Haram, and uh, uh, they deal with the violence in Kenya, you know, during the, not the election eight yeah. years ago, seven yeah. years ago, uh, Lord, the Lord's Army in Uganda. That's what our lawyers do, going around as a statesman, respectable statesman, trying to broker peace, uh, to try to champion uh, uh, issues, uh, some of it controversial, because not everything in African culture is acceptable. Mm -hmm. I mean, homosexuality is a problem in Africa, mm -hmm. and they have this stupid concept that, that is, it, is, it is an alien, it is something the Western people bring you here. I don't say, guys, you know, just calm down. And uh, we have to say, to, say, to say these things. Mm -hmm. So that's why, sorry, it's a long answer no, to no, your no, question. Yeah. But we need to get all the good people on board and enable them to go out and make a change. Mm -hmm. And we need a lot of a change. Mm -hmm. Not only political or economic, but also in our culture. Mm -hmm. We need to change the negative aspect of our culture. We have a president in South Africa who says, okay, I have 15 women. We say, no, Mr. Brady, it's not okay. Oh, but it's a Zulu culture. Or they say, no, 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 this is crap. Because it's not enough to say, oh, it is, it is my, 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 my culture of my tribe, I do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is wrong. It is your job as a leader to stand up and correct what are negative aspects in your culture. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of issues we need to do. It's easier for us to do it because we are Africans. So whatever we say we do, they cannot say, oh, you are imperialist, you are who are, no, I'm an African, and I come from a tribe older than the Zulu, they cannot say anything. So uh, we need to go and tell them, this is nonsense, that has to be changed, okay? Don't it's, tell me it's Africa. It's genuine respect of the culture. This coming is out of genuine love and respect for the culture. Exactly. He's like, no, you challenge it. Now you pass, you have your daughter who heads your philanthropy. Tell me more about that experience. How did you choose your daughter? How did you say, I mean, she's young when she, you pass it on to her. Um, how did you come to that journey? No, I, 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 it was not much of passing things on or whatever. It is getting, you know, children, getting family involved. It started when I was doing business, especially in my first company, because I was very busy. I didn't have time to spend with my children. Because we are running all over the world, we're doing network in Australia, we're doing something in the United States. Or, so I try to use my weekend to spend with my children. Unfortunately, because of our global business as international consultants, there's somebody always in London in the weekend. I don't know why. Either people passing through or going, and then people call and say, oh, Mo, you know, I'm going through London. Can we have dinner? Can we have lunch together? And it's very rude to say no. So I always made it the rule, say, okay, if you want to have lunch or dinner, it's gonna be with my family. Take it or leave it, because I haven't seen those guys, okay? And people actually love this, say, oh, this is because it's, it's a sign of intimacy or respect to have. So from there, Hosh and Hadil, my two children, when they were young, they would come and sit with us, we'd go to somewhere, restaurant or whatever, and they will be around some serious discussion, whatever it is. And I think that helped to be part we don't kick the children out. Again, that's part of our culture. Uh, I notice in in UK, for example, when when people come to visit, they go to the reception room, children are kicked out. And, and not, no, I always say, so children come in. They say to us, whatever we say, we say it in front of them. And they can be part, they can participate. 
that help bring people into into the discussion. That's why both Hosh and Hadil mm -hmm. are involved at some stage. Mm -hmm. But um, they never tried to put a straight jacket. Hadil now is working mostly outside our foundation. She's still in the board, but she's doing the Africa Center here. She's doing another new project about arts and society, some German people and guys from MIT, etc. I want her to blossom. So, is, uh, so I think it's just let people grow up and, and, and find their way. But it is both as having witnessed the journey from afar, it is actually inspiring to see a father sort of endorsing his daughter publicly. And, and, and she is a brilliant leader herself on her own merit. So it is inspiring to actually to have your own endorsement. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, it's, it's really beautiful. I have a million questions, but I'm going to open it up for the audience um, if there is any question. If not, I'm happy to continue. But we have one in here. Oh, there. Sorry. What do we have? We have one here. For authenticity and care and wonderful uh, creativity is really inspiring. My question is about uh, the environment, the impact of the environment that companies have in Africa. And uh, what are your ideas, your, your, uh, your uh, objectives with your foundation regarding the, the impact of companies in Africa? May I, Mo, can I just jump on that question and add, what are also your advice for outsiders, for foreigners to work in Africa? What, be it on a sector of environment or, because our audience here are from all over the world, and what are your advice on Africa as well? Right, I think first, let us, accept that Africa is a normal place. I would love to normalize Africa. Somehow we all have this kind of romantic view. If you ask anybody, what do you think about Africa? Close your eye, what do you think about Africa? Somebody say, oh, I think of lions. Somebody think, oh, I look of giraffes. Or some people say, oh, I, I, you know, football. Or I don't know, uh, refugee camps. You know, I believe Oxfam and, and all those uh, uh, really wonderful people trying to help they actually sometimes do unintended damage to Africa. Mm -hmm. Because I used to cringe every Christmas because the TV screens is full of refugee camp, mm -hmm. dying children, malnutrition mothers. They are trying to raise funds, obviously. And they cannot raise funds without showing this, this kind of pictures. Unfortunately, this gets imprinted in our... And you ask people, I mean, and I was in London the other day, and, and you ask you know, Africa, say, oh, there's so many sick. I said, you guys, you're crazy. We, we have the best athletes in the world, okay? Who wins a marathon everywhere? Soccer, football. No football in Europe without African players. We, you know, we, we run faster than anybody. We jump higher than anybody. We, we, are, we are really healthy people, okay? So. Don't let Oxfam and those guys fool you. That to see uh, some, you know, of course we have tragedies in one country, but again, remember 54 countries. So don't throw a blanket uh, uh, statement over uh, Africa by, by, uh, by what happened in Somalia or in South Sudan. Uh, so again, investing in Africa. After we finish our company, we said, okay, any investment to make, we're going to just invest in Africa. And we're only investing in Africa. We have Satya Capital as a fund, invest in Africa. And I tell the guys who are running the fund, they're all African people, and say, look, guys, don't come back to me. You go and do what you want to do. One thing, you have to do ethical investment. By ethical investment, I'm not saying uh, 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 you have to do uh, charity. Business is business. It's not about charity. You have to do right. But you don't pay bribes. Uh, you don't invest in a company owned by the bribe minister or the uh, you know, MBs. or uh, Debrutize your investments. We don't want to be linked to any uh, of these powers that be or whatever. So that's all what you need to do. Just invest and do your due diligence. I was amazed about a number of people who tried to come to invest in Africa. And some are guided by, you know, good inter, you know, goodwill, and uh, they fail to do their homework. 
And then they come to me and say, oh, we invested in this guys, and, but our partner is very bad. I said, look, excuse me, did, did, you, did you, your due diligence? Same thing if you invest in France, in Germany, and somewhere, and choose a bad partner, or you choose a thief as your, you, you got yourself to blame, okay? So treat Africa as a normal country. Treat us Africans as normal people, or just like you. Guys, you know, we have to be a bit darker. Fair enough, we got maybe too much sun. It's fine. But you, just let's normalize the situation and do the work we want to do. Returns on investment in Africa historically has been higher than any other place in the world. Not because Africa is fantastic. Again, it's the normal law of money. The lack of capital mis meant that capital become more valuable. You get more return for your capital because there is lack of capital in Africa. Because big banks, big investors, the big hedge funds, whatever, don't know much in Af about Africa. They don't know much, they don't do much there. So it's a lack of investment. So it's fine. I'm happy as an investor with that. As an African, I'm sad. I'm happy to have less competition because you guys are investing in, 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 in your whatever uh, uh, you have here Apple or, 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 or Microsoft or, uh, or General Motors or whatever, and I'm happy to invest in Africa, so it's okay. But as an African, I'm sad because I really think investment creates jobs, create prosperity, especially ethical investment. Uh, I think is, is, is important. What I'm hearing from you is integrate all the values together. Yeah. The business value, the philanthropic value, the personal values, integrate them, you yeah, know, in, in your works. actions, yeah. yes. Any other questions you have there? Yeah? Hi, Mo. Thank you for sharing. It's really inspiring. So a quick question. Um, so you have an app website that actually um, that tracks corruptions and governance. Have you thought about sharing that with some Asian countries? Because I think a lot of them Have you thought about that. sharing your index, your Mo Ibrahim index? Uh, or your app corruption. or your website. Your website with yeah. Asian countries. My, our site is open. I no, think collaboration. You can, I mean like help them to track some of the Asian to countries. To do it for Asia, I mean. Yes. I think that's, that's a little bit really not right because Asia, we have more entrepreneurs, more billionaires, more philanthropists than we have in Africa. And you have more people than we have in Africa. It is your job to do your continent. It's not for me, an African, to come and do your continent. You guys are three billion people. Why none of you is standing up and saying, I'm going to measure progress in my continent? You go for an African to say, oh, please come <laughs> and do this true. for us. <laughs> it's not right. <laughs> That's yes. fair. <laughs> we have, uh, okay, we have three questions. Maybe we take, okay, we'll take them one. Can we take all three of them at the same time, or is that too much? Uh, that's fine, yes, okay. for sure. Muhammad here. Yeah, it's working. I have uh, two quick questions for you. Uh, one is you have spoken very highly of what it is that makes you get out of bed every morning and what is it that as a global leader keeps you from sleeping at night? And the second question I have is would you attribute your success to being smart or being lucky or both? Sorry, what's the second question? Uh, you, what do you attribute your success, smart or lucky or both? I think both. That's easy because you always need luck, whatever you do. Uh, you, there's no crystal ball, you can see what, uh, you do your best and the things will happen. As for what keep me sleepless at night, uh, I really worry about where are we go, where, where are we going as, as a world actually. I see a lot of dissatisfaction, I see a lot of di division, I see collapse of, of old uh, establishment parties. Uh, rise of populist movements. Uh, I think you are aware of what's happening in Europe recently, and we had very divisive elections. You know, uh, the two dominant parties in France disappeared. Uh, you know, before that, Italy, we have 
question mark over what's going to happen in Italy. We have Brexit. We have there is a lot of issues globally happening, and suddenly I see this and uh, I think unfair backlash against uh, globalism, as if all the problems are because of globalism. Without, I believe in data, and we're trying to have our discussion in Africa based on data and facts. Mm -hmm. What's happening now, the discourse around us is no lo longer based on data or in facts. It's uh, just, uh, 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 it's like a TV show, to be honest. I mean, when I watch what's going on there, it's, 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 it is snippets, uh, you know, slogans thrown at people, uh, total disregard of numbers or facts. You invented a new term, alternate facts or alternate reality. We never heard about that before. This is the most technologically advanced society in the world. And you tell us about alternative facts. What is alternative facts, guys? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, are we bringing our children based on stuff? We're, no longer we're having discussion based on reality. The fact is, the, the, our fortunes have improved a lot because GDP increased a lot before because of, of global globalization. You would not have had Apple. You would never have had Microsoft. You would never have had Amazons without globalization. This would have stayed as US companies. You need to remember that because that means globalization. All these Apple phones are made in China. None, nobody would have bought an Apple phone in Africa or in Asia if without globalization. You have to understand how many jobs have been created in this country because of globalization. But globalization means also two-way streets. And I found it so amazing. I mean, if I, you look at in Britain, where I live, actually, I mean, it's, it's so amazing. In a country there, we go anti-global because one of the most global countries in its history was Britain. But they forgot that. It was globalization under the empire rule. Britain ruled most of this world 200 years ago. My country, Sudan, was told, you don't do anything, you produce cotton. Egypt, you produce cotton because I need mm -hmm. cotton in my factories. Yes? All these guys were manually weaving their clothes in India. Millions of jobs disappeared overnight because of the textile factories in US and UK. Was that not globalization? Mm -hmm. But it was fine, because it's globalization in our own terms. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have more open globalization, two-way, we start to complain. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. You are happy to win and unhappy to lose. It is win and lose at the same time. For each steel job or coal job, died in this country, there are 10 other jobs created in the green, in the, in the technology or in the green uh, uh, energy, and thanks for globalization. But we never count our gains. We only count our losses. And we stand up and say, oh, I lost 50,000 jobs of mining or whatever. Excuse me. You gain 10 million jobs over there, but nobody's talking about that. This divorce of reality is very dangerous because it leads us to make stupid decisions. Just a stupid decision. We shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, so this is kind of stupidity. What keeps me, uh, you know, uh, awake at night? Where are we going to go? There are so many questions, but I think we are running out of time. So I'm going to take the last question from Ethiopia, <laughs> our colleague in Ethiopia, Senator Ghost's colleague. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I'm really proud for uh, as an African. I mean. For, you know, for knowing you and uh, for whatever you said, sir. Uh, saying that, uh, I, I understand that you hold a unique position now uh, in, uh, in our continent. And I'm thinking if there is a possibility that you play a sort of a bridging leadership role, bringing Sudan, Ethiopia, and uh, Egypt around the Nile so that, you know, they can all benefit from the gift of God? Uh, okay, there are things we do uh, 
which by their nature, it is not, you know, it has to be quiet. I spoke to the late leader, Malazinao at the time, and uh, I told him there's a huge misunderstanding. Ethiopia want to do the dam because you want power, not agriculture, because the land around the dam is not good for agriculture. It's not designed for agriculture anyway. God did not design it for agriculture. Egypt needs agriculture and needs water, and there's no problem. As long as the dam was built in a way, it's a question of how to build up the water, uh, the reserve behind the era, and it will take maybe five, six years to build that. And that can be built during the time when you have too much rain, so it doesn't affect the other countries. So it, it, it could be sorted out. Unfortunately, everybody is taking uh, some, some, you know, uh, apparently nationalistic, but I think misinformed position. And uh, we didn't help that Egypt at that time, Hosni Mubarak stopped going to Addis for the meetings. Hosni Mubarak was the leader of Egypt for many years. After the attempt of ass assassination in 1991 or 92, yeah. which Ethiopia has nothing to do with it. It was the Sudanese who, Muslim Brotherhood who <laughs> arranged that. Anyway, but he stopped going there. And Egypt stopped going, really sent a high delegation to, mm. to the African Union, so it's out. There's the dialogue of the deaf. I remember after the uh, revolution in Egypt, I spoke to the uh, foreign minister in Egypt at that time, Nabil, and uh, I brokered a meeting between Nabil and Mala Zinawi to start to really have a proper discussion. And, now is happy. I, I, I sit in the board of American University in Cairo, and I said, look, I can invite you to come to speak publicly in a lecture room about the issues. And uh, because he will not speak with the government because as it happened during Mubarak, the guys who were responsible for the African policy, it's not the foreign minister, it's not the prime minister, it is the Muhabarat, the security people. And of course, the prime minister says, I'm a prime minister. I'm not going to talk to head of intelligence of another country. But the prime minister has no power to speak to me about this. It, it is dysfunctional, unfortunately. Anyway, we tried to broker this meeting. It went very well. Unfortunately, then Morsi came to power. And uh, they had this public meeting broadcast in television. He did not tell the people about the meeting. He did not invite the rest party heads and policy makers and military guys to a discussion about the Nile. At the time, we were trying to explain what's happening so the guys can talk to each other. This meeting was live on Egyptian TV. The president, Mohammed Mor, did not tell all those people that this is live. So imagine the discussion goes in that meeting to say, oh, uh, the way we deal with this problem in Ethiopia is to arm the opposition and we get rid of the regime in, in, in Ethiopia. Yes, you heard that. Uh, somebody says, no, the best thing is just to go and bomb the dam, we we'll bomb the hell out of it. Uh, then somebody else, this is the Egyptian leadership talking on TV about how they undermine the regime. So all the work we're trying to do to bring people together to talk is just gone. So what, what, what do we do if I have stupid leadership like this? I, I, so we try to, to, to help, but only when people are willing to discuss and listen. And to his credit, Malazi Nawu is willing to listen. So I'm happy to come and speak and give a lecture. I'm happy to do this. Can you pass this message? I pass the messages. I spoke to Amr Musa. I spoke to that. But at the end, there's a problem with Egyptian leadership. Unfortunately, we have to wrap because it's, I always enjoy conversations with you and Thank personally you. always enjoy hearing you. And if I am to summarize all what I've heard from you is to go back to the values that you grew up with actually in, the, in, in Sudan, which is help each other, 
It doesn't matter much, how much you have or you don't have, no pockets in the, in the shroud. <laughs> um, and, and share, you know, and you're doing that. What I love, what I hear from you also is you really have a holistic approach, whether it is family, whether it is business, whether it is philanthropy. And in, in the freedom and the, um, you know, the fearlessness in saying it as it is, which is what we need in the world, and a bridging leader that you are. Shukran Thank Jazeelan. you very much. Thank you so, Shukran. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.